Welcome to the Edinburgh TV Festival Leaders Debate, and we are making TV festival history today. For the first time, all five major directors of TV companies are all on the same stage talking about audiences, talking about programming, and talking about talent. What could possibly go wrong? Let me introduce them, should I? First up, a man who admits that he can commission a show just on a snappy title alone. He once turned down the offer of a Ferrari from Richard Desmond, director of programming for Channel 5, Ben Fry. Next, his uh, stable includes BBC One, big clue, the most watched channel in the United Kingdom. He claims to be a passionate football fan, which is weird because he supports Liverpool. Here he is, Danny Cohen, director of television for the BBC. And that so was a goal, I'm just saying. It was so a goal. Now to introduce the woman who wooed Natasha Kaplinsky from the BBC to Channel 5, gave us the alternative general election program starring Jeremy Paxman, and is quoted as saying, if you can't be confident, pretend. Chief Creative Officer for Channel 4, Jay Hunt. Now for the man who brought us Downton, Broadchurch, and also uh, Mr. Selfridge in 2010. He was part of a band here at the festival called No Expectations. He's also apparently been on tour in Godspell. Peter Fincham is director of television for ITV. Finally, the uh, former controller of BBC Three, responsible for comedy hits including Little Britain and Gavin and Stacey. Uh, most recently, he brought a swords and dragons with the fantasy drama Game of Thrones. He says his dream job would be running Alton Towers. We're bound to get on. Stuart Murphy is director of Sky Entertainment Channel. Okay, what could possibly go on? It's going to be absolutely fantastic. I just need to tell you that um, we were doing quite a few tweets in the last session with Whittingdale. It's hashtag EdTVFest if you'd like to tweet along or offer any questions. I've got a, an iPad over there and we can share them with our panel a little bit later on. Let's get cracking. Our, our first question is from Pat Young, Managing Director of Sugar Films and former head of BBC Production. Can we have that question? Where are we? There we are, just down here at the front. We can grab a microphone, that would be really great. Just here. I think it's a question about the BBC. It is. Um, John Whittendale just said that at the end of this whole process, the BBC could be the same shape and size as it is now. Do you believe that's possible, and do you actually think that would be the right outcome? I'm going to say that's with Danny Cohen, is it? Um, well, I. I I think it was good Mr Whittingdale came. I think he came into an environment uh, to, hit, to give people his views on it. I think I was pretty encouraged by quite a lot of what he said, actually. I, I know Martha said she was tweeting some quotes but, quotes, but he said things like, I accept that most people think the licence fee is good value for money. Uh, the BBC's global reputation is second to none. The BBC produces some of the most successful and best programmes made anywhere in the world. Uh, the BBC uh, provides an amazing range of programming for a relatively small amount of money. So I think we'll bank all of those um, <laughs> a, a, as, as good statements. Uh, he also said, I don't determine what programmes the BBC should show. And he said that subscription is not a viable alternative for the BBC. So there was a lot today, I think, that we'd welcome. Um, we know we're not uh, through the process yet. There's going to be a big debate now. Obviously, the government and John Whittingdale are a big part of that debate. But the licence fee payer, uh, the people who pay for the BBC, also need to be absolutely central to that debate. Um, and we also know we are in a tough position. We've taken a £700 million uh, cut to our funding through taking on the over 75s. That is very, very substantial proportion of, of our uh, programme budgets. And we've got to spend the next few weeks and months working out where we're going to make those cuts because that is a tough set. You sound very defensive there, Danny. I mean, he also said that um, he wasn't going to dismantle the BBC. Do you think you're rather overstating your case? Uh, no, I've, I've, I've said quite the opposite, Kay. I've just said there was lots about what he said that we, we really would welcome. But I think it's also the case that if you, if you, if 700 million pounds... But you're pounds, rather defensive, aren't you? <laughs> only when I'm talking to you, Kay. 
<laughs> Only as an Arsenal fan. It's been fan. said before, yep. No, I, I, I've said the complete opposite case, so I, I, I'd, I'd beg to differ with you on that. I've said there's a huge amount we welcome, but we know we're in a process, we know we've taken a big cut to our funding, and we've got to work out how to do that. Is he being too defensive, Joe? Is he being too defensive? No, I mean, I, I think that's exactly right. I think he said things that were encouraging about the BBC and about its cultural impact, while also saying they need to be mindful of their size, which I think is a commercial competitor feels about right. Peter? Um, I've got no views on the subject. <laughs> 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 are we going to are we gonna subsequently have a debate about the future of ITV, Sky, Channel 4 and Channel 5? Great. I'm going to come back to you, but Stuart, your, your first comments. You know, the, the acoustics are really difficult. I know, so I can hardly hear as well. Yeah. But we're, we're, um, they are. Can we sort that out? Have you got anything to say about We can't really hear what issue. everybody's saying. No, we can't, they're saying, so you'll have to shout. I think um, uh, it would be odd, the, the, the pace of creative change and technological change um, and the change in viewers' habits, if the BBC in, you know, charter, at the end of Charter Review is exactly the same shape as now. So I don't think any sensible person argues for the end of the BBC um, we were just saying beforehand, I think four of us have all worked in senior positions at the BBC. Um, we all grew up with the BBC, it gave me my first T-boy job and my first channel controller job. We love the BBC um, and it's really important for everyone that the BBC Strong makes brilliant stuff. I think it's its strongest when it makes stuff that others haven't thought of, whether that's Strictly, because entertainment has a really important part on the BBC, or whether it's Sherlock, or whether it's Peter K, whether it's Radio 3. I think it's less good when um, it makes shows that are very similar to what already exists in a commercial environment. Um, but yeah, I think we all need a strong BBC. I don't think any, any sensible person uh, would, would think otherwise. What about the BBC Trust, Ben? I mean, do you think it's drinking the last chance saloon? It certainly seems that way. Um, uh, that's a bit too clever for me. I don't really... Um, <laughs> oh, damn it, I should have gone in earlier. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's a question I couldn't answer. All I will say is I love the BBC. For me, it's like the royal family in the NHS, a vital part of Britain, one of the best things we've got. I agree with Stuart. I think it's unlikely not to change. It will change. Hopefully it will change for the better. I wish they'd stop sending me DVDs of three programmes because I think that's a bit of a waste of money and it's kind of driving me crazy. But um, I will always love the BBC and uh, we need to support it. The trust questions, I think we need to ask people who are cleverer than me. Got you. Poor Danny, probably. Uh, Chance to be defensive again, Danny. Yeah, no, listen, <laughs> one of the things about the BBC is we, we've spent years being told we don't stand up for ourselves. Uh, we've had criticism of years, why doesn't the BBC stand up for itself? Why is it always taking these punches? We say what we think and then we're, we're pushing too hard on being defensive. So you often can't win, certainly on not on Sky News. The, the, um, <laughs> the, um, you guys are getting the gag because I can't hear a word he's saying up here. Yeah. Really, can we fix this, please, peeps? I'm finding the same with you, Kate. <laughs> the, the, um, uh, what was the question? The trust. <laughs> um, the government are going to make a decision on the trust. Uh, we uh, have the governance range we have. I work very closely with Rona and her team. I think Rona's made a big difference since she arrived at the trust. We're working closely together. They were part of those licence fee discussions. Um, I'm not going to get into a debate about the future governance model because it's above my my role in the BBC. Today. We're going to be talking about talent management uh, in just a moment and Kirsty Williams is uh, from Insanity Talent Management. She has uh, got a question for us I think. She's just down here guys if you'd like to. Microphone number one. There we go. Hi. Are you concerned that major talent is being attracted away from broadcasters to Netflix and Amazon? That's going to be you again, Daddy, but we'll come back to you. I'm going to, I hope you don't mind. I'm going to stand next to you as I okay. ask the question, otherwise I can't hear what you're saying. What do you think, Stuart? Um, so uh, I don't think that's a worry. Um, I think uh, you look at uh, the Ofcom report about um, uh, the reasons people go to Netflix and Amazon, and looking at original programs on over-the-top providers was actually pretty low down the reasons for why they uh, subscribe. And then we do, when you look at the people who have Netflix and Amazon who actually watch their original stuff, it's, uh, I think it's a third. Um, so uh, the talent really we were talking about is Top Gear, I think. And of the Top Gear three talent, I think we're all working with two of them. And uh, the third one is Amazon. So you know, from Sky's point of view, we really rely on Channel 4 and BBC to bring new talent through. Um, that's not really our bag. Um, uh, and as a result, when they do their job, there's a lot of talent swilling around. It's not like it's a definitive number Why of talent. Why is it not Sky's job to bring on new talent? 
Because I think it's quite hard, well, we're not a public service broadcaster, so people come to Sky for recognizable faces. Um, it's very difficult to prompt a subscription or get people to stay with us with brand new talent they don't know. So whenever we're doing a show, we need either a known brand, known talent, known format. That's not what we're there for. Um, whereas actually Channel 4, I think with disability season, you know, with the Paralympics, Jay did, and the team did a brilliant job getting on a whole load of this diverse talent. I think BBC Three and elsewhere on the BBC was a you know, great tradition of bringing on new talent. It's just not Sky's bag. Okay, Jay, when does talent become invaluable? Whoops. Um, I, think I completely agree with Stuart, actually. I think there'll come a point when big name talent will go elsewhere and actually as part of a broadcaster which has got a good budget but a discreet budget, there will come a point when we can't afford to pay for them. And actually for a channel, as Stuart says, that has a remit around developing new people and about innovating in form, I think there'll be a natural churn around that and I feel quite relaxed about it. Yeah, I, I think you were quoted as saying, I think it's The Guardian, forgive me if it wasn't, a lot of big names get to a point in their career where they want to do a different sort of thing, interested in exploring a relationship with Channel 4 and presumably you find that with people like Jeremy Paxman. Yeah, I mean, it goes in different sorts of ways. I mean, we can launch careers for people, and that's fantastic. And I think it's, it's remarkably uh, honest of Stuart to sit there and say that they wait for other broadcasters to grow talent that they can then pick up. I think that's the natural way in which these things work, and I feel fine about that. It's also true that broadcasters who've reached a particular point in their career may want a new lease of life, may want to do things in a different way, may want to be freed from the constraints that the BBC inevitably puts on some talent, and will come to Channel 4 to do something different. And I think it, you know, it seems perfectly fine to me that in the mix, some big name talent will end up going to new entrants the market, that's fine too. Where would you be without Anton Depp? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, uh, Anton Depp, fantastically important to us, um, and, and you, you know, a number of other... Oh, I'll speak up. Can you hear me now? <clears throat> Weird. Up here we can't hear... I don't it might be by design. <laughs> yeah. We cannot hear a single word <laughs> the other people say. That's true. <laughs> it's, it's like One Direction. <laughs> Stuart could be talking about what he's doing this weekend, for all I knew, from his last answer. One Direction. Um, <laughs> I think we're all talking about talent. No, we're talking about Ant and Deck. Ant and Deck, we love them. We hope we've got them for a long time to come. Um, uh, they're quintessential ITV talent. Uh, but I think the starting point was Netflix and Amazon. Um, and I think kind of the sensible view of that, and there's lots to be said about Netflix and Amazon, how they're changing the, the, uh, the, the television landscape. I don't think we, any of us would want to look like kind of people with our head in the sand about that. But in terms of talent, the idea that um, they are, if you, if you like, taking away large amount, numbers of talent uh, from the mainstream broadcast in the UK, I don't think they are, to be absolutely honest. Um, uh, you, you know, the broadcasting system has withstood, has withstood a lot of threats over the years. You know, the rise of multi-channel and so on, so the American, American networks have poached British talent long before um, Netflix and Amazon came along. So I wouldn't say that's the, the primary focus of, of whatever but the concern might be But Clarkson says that he has about. total creative freedom, doesn't he, at Netflix? That's, that was well, one they, of his they, selling they, points. But they sort of would say that. And, and a couple of years ago... Are you saying this, well, you don't believe Jeremy Clarkson? Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm neither believing or disbelieving him, but a couple of years ago we had a, we had a McTaggart from Kevin Spacey who put this great emphasis on the, you, you know, the wonderful thing about Netflix is, is that you, you, know, you can do what you want up to a point, come on. If your show wasn't a hit, then you'll be in exactly the same relationship you'd be in with a conventional broadcaster. Um, it's rather like the idea of Netflix and, and we're not gonna tell you how many people watch the shows. They can't keep that up forever. We can work out how many people watch the shows. We're all working in the same business. How many do you think there are? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. I'm, I'm coming. I'm I've, I've got some million, ITV statistics yeah, in case you ask, okay, but I haven't turned up with some Netflix statistics. It's 10 plus million, I think, is what they say in the UK. Four and a half million subscribers, but broadcast, which is the, uh, the Bible of accuracy. What? 10 million um, people watch, watch the whole Netflix. of House of Cards. Watch Netflix. Watch Netflix. Well, yeah, that, that, what, what does that tell you about a particular programme? Tells me that, that 10 million people watch Netflix. No, no. As I, <laughs> and, and as I started by saying, we, ben, we you know, the, 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 the change in the landscape of television that Netflix and Amazon represent is a, is, is a significant thing. But I don't think that fundamentally any of us is sitting here thinking, oh my God, they're taking all the talent away from us. Who would you want to poach from their channels? Do you know what? In truth, I wouldn't want anybody. Thanks very much. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know what I'm going to ask you, don't you? No. Yeah, you do. Clarkson. Oh, great. <laughs> can I answer the interesting question? It's this, you just... Trust me, who wants to know about Clarkson? Yeah, I Can, I, so. can I just answer that point about uh, talent and competition? You first? will come back to that. Clarkson. 
Did you do the right thing? So I'm going to give you the answer I've given journalists for about the last few weeks, and you can ask me in seven or eight different ways, and I'm going to give you the same answer. We'll see. Uh, which is, there's been a lot of news about it. Uh, there's been a huge amount of news cycles. If I say anything on the, on, on the record here, we'll create another news cycle out of it. Anyone involved, particularly the person right at the centre of it, doesn't need another news cycle out of it. So you've heard Tony Hall's statement on it. Uh, you've heard the detailed response to the I'm, I'm not going to add to that further today. W whatever you ask me, and you, I know you can be very persuasive. When does talent become invaluable? Uh, well, I've been on the record on that a number of times. I don't think any particular one person is ever bigger than a broadcaster. That's something I said here uh, in other places and other places. But I'm not going to comment specifically on, on Clarkson or Top Gear because I don't think So the think headline it's... is Clarkson wasn't bigger than the BBC? Uh, maybe on Sky News. Can I... Can I... Can I... Um, can I, can I, think I it might be elsewhere as well. Can I... Um, well, it was last year's headline as well, so it'd be a repeat. Fantastic. The... the um, um, the, the, the question, the really interesting question about talent and, and competition, which I think is a really important question for all of us, the, the only thing I'd add on that is I think it's actually really good. Uh, I think it drives standards, I think it drives competition, there's nothing wrong with that. The one particular area I think we've got a real challenge on at the moment is drama writing, because the, you know, drama is such a premium at the moment, and finding enough uh, writers ready to uh, do long-form drama over an hour is a really, really big challenge, and, and one I think the whole industry is facing. Okay, we'll come back to that, actually. We'll also come back to repeats in just a second. But we want to talk about audiences uh, as well. And we have a, a question, I think, from... Is it uh, James? Forgive me, James, if I pronounce your uh, surname incorrectly. James M. Taj of Telegraph Hill? Over here. Hi, James. What's your question? Hello. Um, do you think that newer online services know and understand their audiences better than you do? Ooh, who would you like to ask that to? Um, I think I'd like to ask it to Jay, first of all. Jay? Uh, no, not particularly. I mean, I think Channel 4 has been very successful over the years in operating in the online space. I think our data strategy and registration for the data strategy has given us a hugely strong sense of, of our audience. And I think the fact that we're continuing to deliver 1634s in the way that we are suggests that we get what people turn up to Channel 4 to do. I mean, Sorry, Peter, but uh, uh, Channel 4 has just overtaken ITV in peak. The hours between 8 and 11, our delivery of young audiences is now higher than ITV. So in terms of understanding the core audience that we need to deliver, I think Channel 4 has got a very acute sense of those people and, and what they want from a broadcaster. But, you know, they're different, they're different ways of organising their audiences, aren't they? In a sense, that understanding of their acute audience is absolutely core to that business model. Ours is slightly different. We're still a mass audience proposition. But I think we have a strong understanding of who we're trying to serve. Otherwise, we wouldn't be having the success we are. I was going to ask a supplementary about where, where do you think your audiences are going, but Peter, it would seem that your younger audiences are going to Jay. Uh, I don't, I'm not sure which period Jay is referring to, but uh, the yeah, X Factor yeah. starts on Saturday. Eight to 11. Um, <laughs> um, Shall I go back to the, the, the question itself? Uh, well, I'm not sure why we would think that Amazon and Netflix understand their audience better than, than the, these broadcasters who've you know, had a relationship with the audience for decades and, and monitored it very carefully over decades and got to know, got to know our audiences. Again, I think, I th if I may say so, I think we're asking the wrong questions about Amazon and Netflix. Uh, do they know their audience better? Um, to, to me, isn't the issue. The, the issue about how, uh, it's more about viewers. How do viewers want to consume television? How are viewing patterns changing? Uh, that's undoubtedly a significant thing in the, in the industry, and we'd be, we, we'd be mad if we said that that wasn't the case. And and uh, not surprisingly, this is, this is likely to become a theme of, of this Edinburgh. Um, it wasn't a theme of Edinburgh two or three years ago. Now it's very much in front of us. Um, these services, and Netflix in particular, have kind of come a long way very quickly. Um, they're, they're very, very, you know, publicity friendly. You read a lot about them. As I think, I think as a result, a lot of people get the sense that they actually occupy a larger amount of viewing than they do, as I think most people in this room, I suspect, would know. Overwhelmingly, people are still watching the channels that the people on this stage um, are responsible for. I mean, really overwhelmingly. But, as I was saying earlier, if you sort of put your head in the sand and said this isn't a significant different uh, development in, in, in television history, you, you'd be a bit of a Luddite. It is. But I don't think it's a question of them knowing their audience better than us. 
think there's probably um, at Sky, you know, we're different to the other broadcasters. We've got customers. It's a retail relationship, and uh, you know, with things like AdSmart in a commercial break, we can fire off an advert for a uh, for a Ferrari to Ben, uh, but for a, a Lamborghini to Danny. You know, so you can you can fit the car for the uh, different financial bracket available. AdSmart. Um, but all, all I was going to say is, so I think lots of us have loads and loads of information about our audiences. Um, if anything, it, it's easy to get kind of information data blindness. And what I find tricky um, is either great insight to someone on a team who can look at information and draw out a conclusion from that, um, and there's kind of 50% guesswork in that. Um, and then the other thing I was going to say is one of the reasons this is such a brilliant industry and, uh, you know, it's full of fabulously mental, curious people is people in this room suggest things that audiences don't, ne don't yet know they love. So we've all got a million examples, whether it's the undateables or whether it's wild things with us. Uh, you know, the shows that audiences simply couldn't tell you in advance that they love, but when you put them on... They adore them. So Big Brother, you know, audiences, presumably, if you'd have tested that with audiences, they, they wouldn't be that attracted to watching people in a house. But um, do you know what I mean? So we're in the business of imagination. Audience information can get you so far, but we ought to use that as a springboard, not as a, you know, we're not in the algorithm business. I think we're in the imagination business. What are you looking at me like that for? I'm just wondering if I get to answer the question or an entirely separate one. It depends. Which one would you like to answer? I, 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 the, um... I was actually going to ask Ben a question. Ah, uh, a few. Okay. <laughs> are the overnights overrated? Uh, a lot of people will say that they are, yes, but not to me. They're still very important to me. They're a daily measure of how we're doing, whether the audience likes a program, doesn't like a program, how we're faring against the competition, um, what we should renew, what we should kill, what direction the channel's going in, what's over, what's up and coming. So, I mean, I, I but work... isn't it 20th century yes, technology it may be. for 21st century? It may be. And there's all kinds of different ways of looking at them as well, and it's all getting increasingly uh, confusing for someone of my age uh, who can't really add up at the best of times. But um, I have a daily thing where I go, we've had a good night, we've had a bad night, we've had an indifferent night, and at the end of the week, we have a little look at how we've done year on year because my job is to try and grow the channel and increase the impacts and keep the viewers coming and give the viewers what they want and, you know, viewers tell you what they like and what they don't like by watching your television. And you were offered a Ferrari as a result? I was offered a Ferrari as a result it, in order to beat Channel 4. Tell us what happened. I turned down the Ferrari. Yeah, you did. I didn't take the Ferrari. Why? Because when the challenge was set to try and beat Channel 4 across the week, all apologies to Jay because we all love each other really, um, it was a team effort. It wasn't my effort on my own. I can't do my job unless I've got great commissioners, great schedulers, great viewer insight, great press and marketing. You know, we all pulled together. We all did an amazing job that week, but it wasn't my prize to win. It was our prize to win. A round of applause for that, I think. <laughs> What's your online strategy as far as audiences are concerned? Oh, well, that's a big question. I mean, I think on that question of where we are in terms of Silicon, uh, Amazon, Netflix, and so on, I think broadly, um, I think Silicon Valley is a bit ahead of us, if I'm honest. I mean, I, th I think we are quite good at, at the BBC in terms of uh, responding to audience data. I think we've got some way to go on personalization and audience data. But when you talk to uh, Silicon Valley people, whether it's the Spotify people, or taking this beyond television, I, I, I think the way they're using data and the speed with which they're at to it, we we've still got quite a lot to learn. Certainly, I think the BBC has probably we all have in different ways. So I, I, I feel slightly differently about that. We're going to have to accelerate our understanding on that. Um, in terms of online, I, I think we, we see more and more people spending more and more time online. I did a, a ones to watch session this morning um, and I asked some questions in advance. About 75% of the roughly 20 to 30 year olds uh, felt that their smartphone was more important than their TV set. So you can't ignore... Because it can be both, presumably. You can make calls yeah. with your TVs, basically, can't you? you? You can. You can do a number of things with it, and it, it can provide a range of different services, as we all, of course, know. So things are, I think, right, as Peter said, things are changing. Uh, we'd be mad to they, they're not. So I think what we try and do at the BBC is make sure we've got a portfolio of different ways of approaching it. So some linear channels, a really good online offer, spread our bets in that sense so that we know we're offering things on lots and lots of different platforms. What's your online strategy, Jay? I think just going to the audience point, I mean, I think any channel controller who says they don't look at the overnights is telling a bit of a porky pie, frankly, because they do. And, and crudely, it's a way of telling when everyone's watching your shows, self-evidently, and that's important because you're making shows, particularly for a commercial broadcaster, that no one wants to watch. You're going to run into the sound pretty quickly. So I think what's interesting, and there are lessons here from the way the Americans have dealt with it, is you look at some of the performance of, for example, a channel like FX, which just refuses to engage with overnight audiences now, will only talk about plus seven, plus 30, whatever it might be, recognising, as Danny says, that behaviour's changing, and particularly 
for a channel with a, a, a young profile like we have, we'll often see on a show like Made in Chelsea, the pickup on online might be 6% of the total viewing. So I think it's still a really important way of assessing whether we're getting this right, but we just need to get a bit more holistic about the way we report it. And it's slightly frustrating, I think, in this country, we're still locked in a narrative about who beat who at nine o'clock, which is, in the, in, frankly, that isn't a particularly good way of measuring success. And for people in this room, I'd encourage you to be part of the debate to make it a bit more holistic, because it's a much better way of gauging whether something's really connecting with audiences or not than did it win at nine o'clock last night. I agree. Good. Stuart, you, what do you think? Oh, I thought I'd said my bit. Um, I no, can... no, we want to ask you about online strategy. What's your online strategy? Oh, so is that what it was all about? Yeah, sorry, you could, I, I know, I'm sorry. We, you no, no, no. Sorry. I'm not saying that's a joke. I literally am um, lip reading. You can't hear them. I know. Um, uh, online strategy. So, uh, you know, as a, as a platform, our main driver is to get people to subscribe. We make 90% of our revenue from subscription, only 10% from ads. Um, albeit that 10% is worth half a billion pounds a year. I think we're less obsessed with um, uh, online, but certainly obsessed with off-linear and trying to monetize viewing to Sky Go or uh, box set. Um, uh, but the key driver for us is making sure people subscribe. If that's for one show that they watch, like Game of Thrones, or if it's for 30 shows they watch, we don't sort of care. So r ratings are not as important to us. Um, our online strategy only matters where we can monetize it. Um, I've run out of words. Okay. Yeah. Talking a lot about ads there, it's time for our ad break as well, halfway through our session. Um, let's bring in Laura Mansfield, Managing Director of Outline Productions. Where are you? Can't see you? There, just there. Just pass that mic along if you wouldn't mind. That's great, thank you. Hi. Um, can the leaders share what percentage of your output is funded or co-produced by Group M Entertainment and what your view is about the growing influence of this company? Anybody in particular want to put that to? It's to the whole panel. Okay, let's start with Ben then while I'm here. Well, like I said, I wasn't very good at maths, so I'm not be able to get, going to be able to give you a percentage. Um, uh, it's, it's anybody's guess, really. Uh, there is a cap, though, on what I will spend with Group M. Um, I think Can I tell if you what I... Richard Desmond said? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He said it's very difficult when Group M says to us that if you don't think we're going to cut you by... 10 or 20% then say, no, I'm not happy about it. I'd love to do something about it, but what's that program? The man with 10 stone testicles? I haven't got them. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but that was about cutting, out, cutting our advertising if we don't work with Group M. And I don't have that kind of relationship with them. We have a really good relationship with them. Um, I'm all about editorial. The suggestion is that Group M wants you go to go no. towards well, Group M Entertainment. I, I don't feel that at all. If that's the case, it's being done so subtly that I don't notice it. Um, for me, the priority has to be, what is the editorial? And do I think it's right for the channel? The second thing is that the independent company who's working with us has to be happy with the arrangement. The third thing is, can I afford the program full stop? Um, I'll be honest with you, uh, with what we're dealing with and the budgets that I work with, I'm, I'm happy to look at wherever money can come from in order to give me a better and a stronger schedule. But I don't like having a gun held to my head as is... As is um, do you feel you that's know. what's been... What's no, been? that's exactly it. And if I was feeling that, I think people would know about it. So I, I, we've worked very hard to have a, a, an honest, fair, two-way street relationship with Group M. I think it's inevitable that it's, there's going to be more of that kind of uh, arrangement going forward. I think we're all going to have to get used to the fact that you know, money is going to get scarcer with the diversification of you know, programming and television and online and Netflix and all that kind of stuff. And certainly commercial channels are going to have to start finding new and creative ways to bring money in the door to keep those budgets going and to, um, and to, to keep making creative programs. So for me, uh, Group, uh, Group M works well. If it didn't work well, um, I think you'd know about it. Jay, Group M is presumably equally as important to your bottom line as well. No, no, it's not, actually. I mean, Group M, the partnerships we've done with Group M have been useful but negligible in terms of our total spend. So we've got in excess of £400 million that we're spending on original programming, and Group M's a tiny fraction of that. I haven't got the exact percentage because... I didn't think you'd ask me that. Um, what, two things, I'd echo one of the things Ben says. I mean, if you don't want to work with Group M, say, don't work with Group M then. And the second thing is, it's been very helpful for us to be able to allow us to move into genres which are much harder on a channel that is not part of the Saturday Night Entertainment entree. So for example, Group M were involved in, in The Jump, which is self-evidently a very, very expensive show. So it's, I suppose, icing on top of the cake for us, but it's a tiny part of what we do. And I think we're very mindful of the fact that if it's taking producers to a place they don't want to go to, then we don't do it. What about you, Peter? Um, well, we spend about a billion pounds a year on content, and I think Group M, we do deals with Group M for about 10 million of that, so 1%. How important are they to your bottom line in that you have to work with them 
even if you then find that Group M Entertainment is an integral part of your schedule? Well, uh, I mean, obviously, Group, M, Group M's main relationship with the commercial broadcaster is on the other side, on the, the ad sales side. Yeah, so they, they have set up their own uh, yeah, get, yeah, but they, they, they don't produce things. They, you know, it's slightly misunderstood the mechanism of a Group M deal. I don't know if it's the same for Ben or for J. I I don't even know. Um, but it doesn't make any difference editorially. Um, it, does have, it does have an effect on rights. It can only be done with a production company who are happy to work with Group M. Um, and we certainly have done some things with Group M. We're very happy to have done them, but, but it's not a very big part of our business. I think the implication of the question may be, is this something that's kind of uh, fundamentally altering the relationship between broadcasters and producers? No, no. I mean, I completely agree with what Ben was saying, that that we're all going to have to get used to new funding models, more complicated funding models. Models, You know, audiences want very expensive programming. Um, we can't always pay for it in full. So we're quite open-minded about how we will go about it. But I don't think, um, uh, I think we'd be getting this quite out of proportion if we thought that this was some fundamental change. John McVeigh, who is uh, the head of the trade body pact, said uh, a couple of years ago now, Group M is so powerful in the United Kingdom ad market, controlling one pound in every three pounds spent on UK commercials, that broadcasters are pressured to make production companies commission shows from work with Group M Entertainment, which invest in programmes. Do you disagree with that? No, not really. No. No. Well, I mean, rather, I disagree, yes. Yeah. There we go then. <coughs> what do you think? Um, so, yeah, we spend 600 million a year on new British shows. Um, about 7 million, I think, is, is with Group M or companies like Group M. There's quite a lot of companies like Group M now. Uh, we really like our relationship with Group M, so we don't overly depend on it. As I, I, think, I think Channel 4 and Channel 5 spend a, you know, have a, a much bigger relationship than 7 million. Do you know? I don't know, and I don't care. But, um, you know, it, it, I, I always assumed you did. I mean, I think for me, it's I want to make sure that the money goes on screen. Um, the money they say they're putting in goes on screen. I want to make sure indies don't feel uh, pushed into a corner because our relationship with indies is everything. We don't have an in-house. Um, but, yeah, if it's money on a show that I was going to commission anyway um, and the indie's happy with it, I'm delighted. I mean, Wild Things was a Group M commission, uh, but I think we've done other long-running factual series. Um, I know, obviously, you don't have a deal with them, it being the BBC, generally, but what do you think of uh, Martin Sorrell and his approach to business? What do I think of Martin Sorrell and his approach to business? <laughs> Blimey. Is this a Financial Times interview now? No. Uh, um, I'm well, not going to let you dodge this question. Well, no, I, too. I don't, I, if I'm really frank, I mean, I, I've, I've met, my wife knows Martin Sorrell, I've met him a couple of times, I, I, I haven't followed his career immensely closely, so Don't I make can't. fun of the questions that people have posed <laughs> I, I'm not making fun of it, I just, I don't know how to answer it. I, I, I don't know much about Martin Sorrell. What do you think about Martin Sorrell? I think he's fabulous, especially with the way he's talking about China at the moment. Laura, back to you, what did you think? Yeah, I, I just wanted, it, it's, it's a growing influence and I think it's important to understand as, a, as an indie and as chair of PACT um, what the broadcaster's position was um, and understand whether indies are ever pushed into doing deals or have the total liberty to do the deals they want. I think we welcome new sources of funding. New sources of funding are fantastic. I think the fundamental is that, certainly with us at ITV, if, if, it, if an indie brings us an idea, a program that we want to commission, we will commission it. Um, and in most cases, we can afford it. Um, uh, you know, there are indies who come to us and say, we've already started talking to Group M about this. And I sometimes we'll say to those indies, well, that's fine, but it's not going to make any difference to whether we like the idea or the script or whatever. And, and I think sometimes people get the wrong end of the stick, which is that if... If Group M are involved, it's free to the broadcaster, and therefore we're just bound to say yes. But that's not the case, because obviously, you know, the complicated relationship between Group M and a commercial broadcaster, um, uh, and it is all part of that complicated relationship. So, yes, it may be a growing thing. I don't think it's, I don't think it's a very big growing thing, or it isn't in our case anyway. Um, but I don't think, you, you know, if you're talking on behalf of PACT and on behalf of Indies, I don't think it in any way should make any difference to the fundamental, which is approach a broadcaster with a program you believe in, a script, a format or whatever it is, and the broadcaster will commission it if they, if they like it. Takes us nicely on to content. Tara Conlan has got a question, I think. 
on content. Where are you, Tara? Hello, Tara. Hello, she's over here. Just here, right at the front, please. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Tara Conlan, The Guardian. Um, could I just ask, and this seems to be repeating my Daily Mail days asking this, but how much of your schedules um, are repeats, please? Who do you want to ask that to, Tara? Um, start off with Ben first. Oh, God, okay. percentage question again. I wish I wasn't going to you know, give me a break. Well, uh, so uh, 11 o'clock at night is generally a repeat. Um, Saturdays, uh, which used to be mainly movies, uh, tend to be made up of repeats now. And uh, we'll play some factual repeats on Sunday. Going forward, um, there'll probably be less, maybe slightly less repeats because we want to do more origination at 10 and 11. And uh, if there are the same amount of re repeats, we'll move them around the, around the schedule. What we know at Channel 5 is if you repeat a program, it does not do nearly the numbers it did originally. So we try to avoid uh, repeats as much, as much as possible or play them in the schedule where, you know, mainly out of, out of peak time, very late night, before you go into Super Casino or whatever it is, or, um, at, or weekends against, you know, whatever the competition is. Good to bring Stuart in on that. Repeats don't play as well, Stuart. Can you hear me, sorry? Repeats don't play as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I was just, I just wondered why you're even bothered. I mean, it was, just seems an odd question to me that um, in an age where, uh, you know, you can look at the performance, as Jay was saying, you look at the performance of the initial transmission of a show, then the people who watch on Sky Plus of that show, and then the people who watch the repeats of that show, and then later on they might watch on box set or DVD or electronic sell-through. It just seems like we're living in circa 1985, if we're talking about repeats. I'm happy to talk about repeats, but it's so, it's so irrelevant to our business model, I couldn't even take a stab at, at the figure. Um, and I actually don't know who cares. Um, I think John Langraff, uh, who runs FX and is being interviewed this week, made a great point in an article earlier on this week saying, is there too much TV? And I think the issue for audiences is trying to search out the, their new obsession that they can spend a lot of time investing emotionally in and watch whether it goes out on a Tuesday night at 9 o'clock or whether they watch it six months later or in half term or, uh, you, know, uh, you know, at 2 in the morning, it, it just doesn't matter. That's not the world we're in. I suppose producers care, though, don't they, because they want to, you to produce more content yeah, so no, they can point. pay their mortgage. No, 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 totally good point. And um, if, if the number of repeats affects the amount of commissioning money we spend, then that's a fair point. That would be a worry. For us, it doesn't. Uh, our, you know, we've made a public announcement we'd spend £600 million on new British shows last year. That's now gone up. Um, I think while there's money to be made in the commissioning of uh, British shows, I suspect all of us will do that. Um, uh, but, yeah, we, we don't... When I was at the BBC, but this was 10, 12 years ago, we used to look at repeats, but mainly because people like Tara were at the Daily Mail asking about repeats. <laughs> but it, it, didn't really, it didn't really matter. I don't know how the rest of the panel... The, Daily Mail, really would run a, the Daily Mail, every Christmas, would look at the um, uh, Radio <laughs> Times and come up with an article saying there are 287 hours of repeats this Christmas. <laughs> the article itself was a repeat, by the way, from the previous Christmas, <laughs> from the Christmas before that. Um, but... Fundamentally, I, I agree with Stuart. This is uh, in, a, in a world of multi-channel and everything else. Uh, I mean, the answer in relation to ITV before you, before you ask Kay is very little. We've repeated a bit over the summer. Uh, we've had some drama repeats over the summer. Come the autumn from next week on, almost nothing in our schedule will be repeats. But I don't think there's any stigma in repeats. I think there's an imagined stigma in repeats. And I'm a an secret, well, not a secret anymore. I'm a huge fan of Come Dine With Me, and that does incredibly well, hugely repeated on Channel 4. Yeah, but I, just, I think it's quite funny, this conversation, because there's a sort of air in, in the room about Netflix and Amazon. Well, should we ask them about repeats? Because actually, if you think what's driving those businesses, often it's, it's shows that have been commissioned for terrestrial channels that have been watched over and over again. So I think the stigma around repeats is changing anyway as the world changes. From a channel form point of view, just on that particular question, I mean, partly because we've got a very young audience, uh, I think their sense of we need to move on and do more is greater. And so if you look at the peak time schedule on Channel 4, even across the summer, almost all of it is, is wholly originated. Um, uh, you know, I'll, I'll be honest, I mean, so I think there are three BBC One controllers standing on this thing. It was quite nice being at the BBC and be able to run a new tricks repeat and get two million for it. And I think from a producer's point of view, you shouldn't regard it as a dirty word either, because frankly, from a commercial broadcaster's point of view, if you can get extra value out of a high tariff item like a drama, then that's quite good. So, I, you know, I think it's just, it's not the dirty word it once was. I think the whole world has changed. Two million. That's what I get for my afternoon show, <laughs> thereabouts. Um, really? <laughs> really? Light, little light. You cut them all around the world, and it is live, and it is only the once. So, what do you think? Um, well, it differs with, 
uh, differs per channel. Uh, on BBC One, it tends to be between 5 and 7%, which uh, is actually quite, it's quite low, actually. It used to be a bit higher than that. And because repeats don't work as well as they used to on le linear television, we've actually driven that down. It's different on the digital channels because... My dad's an army on BBC Two, I'm being told to ask you. Are you a fan? I love it. Yeah. Well, there you I go. I remember watching it the first time round. There you go. Look, I, I, I agree. With I don't think it's a dirty word. Uh, I, I think that point that, you know, the, the back catalogues you're now seeing on the on-demand service, a lot of them are repeats of, of content that people in this room have made. Uh, people watch things. If you look at uh, digital channels, uh, the plus seven is really, really important because the repeat of that show can often give it an audience five, six, seven times the initial showing. Audiences understand that. I don't think they've got a problem with it. What do you watch on your own channel? I watch quite a lot. I watch a lot of benefit programs, um, which well, I enjoy hugely. Uh, Do you know how many benefits, how many programs with benefit you have in the title on Channel? 5? I know I had about four or five last night. How many do you think you've got <laughs> at the moment? Well, uh, this today or this week or this year? This t this season. What's the season? Nineteen. Nineteen. That's what well, individual programs. Mm -hmm. That's okay. Happy with that. <laughs> Well, how many episodes of Coronation Street are there in the schedule? Or, I'm not sure you, you know, can 20... compare Coronation no, Street it, with benefits programs, or maybe it's, you can. It's a genre that has really, really, really worked for us. Um, I didn't expect it to work so well two and a half years ago when we commissioned the very first um, on Benefits and Proud, and it kind of exploded. I would ask people um, to watch some of the programs before making a generalisation that they're all about scuzzy people and low life. Some of them are incredibly moving programs, 12, year, 12 years old and living on benefits last night or the Benefits Hotel last week, which was heartbreaking about middle class people who'd hit very hard times through no fault of their own, um, trying to get their lives back together again. It's a really big social issue at the moment. It's a very contemporary subject. Um, I'm going to stand by them. I do think that um, next year there will be less. And I do wrestle with the fact that sometimes are we playing too many, but we've just had a six-week period without Big Brother in the schedule. We had it last year, and I'm a commercial channel, and I've got to make the numbers stack up. You know, I've got pressure of impacts, pressures of advertisers, got to keep the ratings going, and they are a big ratings driver. Okay. But I think everything in its place, um, but I'm not embarrassed by them. I'm very proud of what we do, and I would say watch some of them, because they're very be. well made. I watch a lot of them, trust Thank me. You. Uh, I presume you're not going to say Top Gear. What about Strictly? What about Strictly? Yeah. You Is that your favourite programme? Uh, of course I want to be on it. Okay. Why do you think I brought it up? Um, yeah, I'm a big fan of Strictly. Uh, I, I think um, Claudia and Tess have, have done a brilliant job taking over the show. We're, we're in the middle of a few days of announcing uh, who the new lineup is, and we know it's massively loved around the country, so yeah, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of it. Do you, you watch it? Of yes. course I watch it. I watch it every single week, but it, it allows me to segue into uh, what might be happening as far as X Factor is concerned, and going back to what John Whittingdale was talking about, and the fact that shiny floor telly shouldn't really be uh, on the BBC up against ITV at the okay. same time. I mean, is, is that a concern of yours? Um, well, I, I, I mean, I, I think I saw Danny in, a, in an interview saying something about nobody's marching outside the BBC because of the half hour overlap between the X Factor and Strictly. But there are other ways of finding out what your audience uh, think than wait for them to march in the street. Um, so, yeah, I, th I think there's a bit of an issue here. We're actually going to do something we haven't done before. Um, we're going to tell the world... Um, uh, well, just say, is this an exclusive that you yeah, can it is. share with yeah, us? Yeah, it is. We're going to tell the world the start times of all X Factor broadcasts this autumn. So we think what that's... What do you hope to achieve by that? Well, we, we, I mean, our audience tell us they don't want those two shows to overlap. And, I mean, we've just, we've just had a thing that's happened, which I, I'll tell you about. And I, I don't think Daniel will even know about this, because this is something going on in the engine room, not kind of up on the bridge where he is. But... Um, what, what happens... No, I, I just, I'm going to have to explain this in a bit of detail. What happens with Billings is that, and everybody up here on the stage knows this, is that we have a number of exchanges. So on, on Saturday week, um, uh, there's, a, there's a Strictly Come Dancing launch show, and there's a, the third X Factor audition show. And we had a first exchange, which had um, the, the X Factor show starting exactly when the Strictly show ended. Um, which was a pretty happy outcome for everybody. Um, uh, I think it was 7 o'clock, uh, strictly 8.15 X Factor. They're each 75-minute shows. So, so that revealed to each broadcaster what we were doing. So you know, the BBC guys had seen what we were doing. So in this second exchange, they moved the X Factor 20 minutes later. Strictly. Now, uh, strictly, sorry, 20 minutes later. Now, 
I don't know why they did that. They may have a reason for doing that, but that doesn't feel to me like what you might call an unavoidable clash. That feels a little bit like, let's try and see if we can clip the X Factor's wings. Let's see if we can, you know, get a ahead of them during the first 20 minutes they're on air. This really matters to us because we are a commercial business. So this is business to us. Uh, I know from my own time at the BBC, it's a bit of a game, to be honest. Um, so anyway, we, we're not going to move later, but there will be an overlap between the two. But what we're going to do, which we hope is helpful, we're literally going to publish the start times of all X Factors this autumn because all the evidence we have from our audience is that they don't want the two to overlap and it's perfectly possible so for them not to, to overlap. So you're going to do that in order for the BBC to say, OK, we won't overlap? Well, we're doing it to tell our audience when to expect the X Factor. Whether the BBC then respond by that, that's up to them. Let's find out. Hi. <laughs> yes. I do this for a living. Well, it's a perfectly innocent strategy announcing it. I'm sure the audience is writing down in their diaries every start time, and it's nothing to do with the BBC whatsoever. Listen, there are these things happening all the time. We've noticed uh, very often that suddenly Emmerdale can find itself in a double bill against EastEnders with astonishing regularity over the last two years, Peter. Um, I'm, sure, I'm sure there's no reason for that. Yeah, but hang on, Danny. Ma 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 finish, ma finish my answer. It is different. May I finish my answer? There, there is to England throwing. Uh, Jay, I know when you were at BBC, the BBC, you were... Uh, rather competitive Very too. Competitive, yeah. uh, I think there's always been a degree of that. We don't look for it. Peter, you could always call me if you're concerned about one of those things. We have each other's numbers. Um, I, I think there's toing and froing on it, but of course we can work our way through these things. Are you going to call him? Well, we, we do talk to each other, and, uh, and uh, uh, you know, there's a kind of long history of liaison over this. I, I, I really don't want to misstate this. I'm not arguing with the BBC's um, uh, right to be competitive. Um, uh, I think it was my, I mean, you've got several BBC One controllers up here. I think it was my predecessor um, when, when she stepped down from being BBC One controller, when asked, what's your proudest achievement, said to beat ITV in the ratings. Um, I don't think today a BBC One controller would say that. I think we live in a different climate, and a climate um, uh, where, you know, the BBC puts a heavy emphasis uh, and is expected to put heavy emphasis on being distinctive. So I don't think a BBC One controller would say that, but would they think it? is another matter, and, and I think that, you know, we're, we're, I, I take down his points entirely, we, we're all sorts of, um, you, you know, overlaps, scheduling against each other. I've tried over the years to talk to the BBC more than once about whether we should keep drama away from each other, but I've, I've, I've been rebuffed in that, in that conversation. But that goes on. There is a very particular thing about The X Factor and Strictly Come Dancing. They're both enormously popular shows. Um, many, many viewers want to be able to watch one and then the other. So what we're doing, we hope, makes it more possible that can happen. I suppose, easier. I suppose, I suppose they things. could always Sky Plus it, but we'll come back to that. <laughs> What, are you going they, to guarantee... They need a Sky subscription for that. Uh, are you, yep, you do. Or you could pay the licence fee, I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not getting involved. So um, my question to you is, will you guarantee this afternoon that we will not see the X Factor and Strictly No, fashion? I can't guarantee that. I mean, some of our start time's a bit around when the live sport event happens, and then you have the live sport as, as Peter and Jay. And so think, if there's no live uh, sport then, event, then you will? No, and, I, 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 and the same way Peter won't guarantee that Emma Dale won't have a double bill that goes Let's across the Let's leave Emma Dale to one side, well, because these are the two of the biggest shows on a Saturday I, I night Emma, throughout the year. And Emma Dale and EastEnders run three or four times a week, all week, and they're as big. So look, these clashes happen. We try and work through them. Most of the time, we do work through them. Uh, but they do happen sometimes. Um, I think actually in the last few years there's probably been a bit less of it than there has been in the past because we have talked more. Jay, you wanted to, you wanted to come back? Well, I just, you know, it's interesting because uh, Danny's absolutely right. I was a very competitive controller of BBC One and I suppose this may, you know, maybe this comes with the benefit of standing outside for a little bit. But I think, I just think it's interesting in the context of what Secretary of State has just said as well that the BBC does need to be mindful of its scale. I mean, the point Peter's making is if X Factor loses young share, then that is real revenue to a commercial business that will have to make a set of decisions. There, I know, I've done it. There are no consequences if Strictly takes a hit. There are no consequences. So, you know, we've just had a very, very similar situation with BBC Two with the show. And I think, you know, I'm not on any level suggesting the BBC shouldn't be competitive, but I think it just needs to be mindful of the fact that the people on the other side of the fence are not taking billion pound of public money and, th and that's just a different dynamic and as I say maybe I've you know newly evangelical because I've left and I certainly was competitive and I think Strictly and X Factor is very very difficult because they both serve family audience as well so finding a way of them completely avoiding each other and serving a family audience is very very hard but 
I do think it's, it's a legitimate point that Peter's making. There is that thing, isn't there, that I think now I'm outside the BBC, you can see that the BBC is there for licence fee payers, not for the furtherance of the BBC. And usually they intersect, but occasionally there are times when you sense that a decision has been made that is mainly because it's the BBC wanting to protect the BBC, not the BBC putting licence fee payers' interests first. We have an example at the moment, Sky Go. BBC won't let BBC content go on Sky Go unless it's via a BBC iPlayer. That's not in the interest of licence fee payers. That's in the interest of the BBC. I think if ever there's I obviously a can't make a point no, about sure. Sky subscriptions, but did you want to? Um, did I? I don't as know if I did. As far as Sky Plus is concerned. It's really good and cheap, and it's really worth its money. There you go. Um, <laughs> but, um, but I was just going to say, if ever there's a clash, surely, Danny, and we're close, and we, sp we speak as well, surely it's, for the, numbers. surely it's for the BBC to move. Because there's no advantage so, so, to BBC uh, trampling on so ITV's just, ratings. Just on Sky Go, if you're saying we should absolutely disaggregate our content... Not allowed, disaggregate. Have it on channels. Have it on channels. Yeah. BBC One, BBC Two. Have it on channels, not disaggregate. But, and you won't do that. You only allow no, it we through BBC to, we, iPlayer. We, we want, yeah, we want to use the iPlayer. I don't think there's anything wrong with the distribution mechanism, Stuart. I there think is, because you're not in the distribution business. You should be looking at Sky Go, where 12 million licence fee payers use it, and say there's, it's odd that BBC One and BBC Two are not at the top of there. We're not on about disaggregating. Don't pretend... You know, no, don't try and confuse the issue. We want the channels there. You won't allow them unless it's via BBC iPlayer. That's not in the interest of licensing. I, I, Stuart, we'll probably have to take this to a certain place. I, I don't agree. I think I, keeping iPlayer together is a very important I thing, actually, and we should that, keep it together. Well, I think the theme that might link these two completely separate points, and I wonder whether Jay and Stuart would say the same, is that if you've worked at the BBC, as we all have, running channels at the BBC, and you're fundamentally a supporter of the BBC, as I am, absolutely are, um, absolutely am. Nevertheless, when you leave the BBC and you're heading off somewhere else, to Sky or to Channel 4 or to ITV, wherever you, and you look back over your shoulder at it, it looks a whole lot different than when you were inside it. That, I think, is the point in common. And so, Stuart's, I mean, I never even thought about the Sky Go point, but I can absolutely see that Sky perspective as somebody who once worked at the BBC supports it fundamentally and yet sees it in a slightly different light from a commercial perspective. We're going to talk about diversity now. Let's move on. Ali Bailey, where are you, Ali? Hello, Ali. Hello. Hello. Oh, there she is, right in the corner, waving. Hi, Ali. You've got a question about diversity for our panel this afternoon. Thank you. Diversity. What is the biggest practical barrier to achieving a more diverse and representative industry? And how are you helping to tackle this in everyday, real terms? Very good question. The biggest barrier? I think the biggest barrier has to be talent, people. Um, I take it very, very seriously, diversity. Um, I think we reflect it very well in our programming. I know that Viacom have not put together their initial um, charter statement of intent yet, but it's on the cards. Um, So for me, I think it has to be, you know, who's out there? Why am I not seeing them? Why are they not coming in? Why are the production teams not employing them? How can we make sure that everybody gets a fair crack at the whip? How can we make sure that unrecognized talent is recognized or nurtured or brought in or given a chance? Um, on screen, I think it's much more um, manageable in terms of you make the effort, you make the decision that if you are doing a long-running series, you've got to tick the boxes. And it is about ticking boxes to a certain extent. You have to make that effort, because some, for some people it doesn't come naturally. I think it's important that we make that effort. Um, but the, so on screen, I'm, I'm much more confident about Channel 5, and I think we're in a very, very, very good place. But I, do, I am concerned about, about young upcoming talent and uh, diversity getting a chance in production in particular. Danny? Um, I think we're doing okay, but we need to do better. Um, I, I think if there was a single thing I'd point to, it's probably, you know, things are anecdotal, but they, um, they reflect patterns. Um, I was talking to a producer who said that they were the only black producer on their programme over uh, a 10 or 12 year period. And uh, he said the reason for it, there was nothing malicious or prejudiced about it. It was, a, it was a thing about not thinking hard enough about it. So it was one of those year, yearly annual programmes. And... Um, the, I think the production manager or, or someone else on the production side of the, the show got out last year's call sheet 
team had done pretty well and phoned up last year's call sheet and they ended up with the same team every year. And so nothing changed. And, and so I, I think the, uh, the biggest threat is just we keep doing the same and we don't think hard enough about how to change. Um, and then once you challenge on that, you think, okay, we're going to have to find our teams in different ways. Sorry about that. Sorry. Uh, once you think about them, how to find it, then you can begin to think about how do you change uh, the group of people you've got. But I think as an industry, we, we've still got a long way to go. I think we've got a long way to go, but I lived through lots of sort of diversity initiatives, and all credit to Lenny Henry, I think the shot across the bows that, that he launched has had a profound effect, and actually, I mean, I won't go through all the bits of our 360-degree diversity chart, so fascinating though it is, but I mean, there are palpable changes. I remember when last week to one of the most uplifting things I've been to for a long time, which is we've given a commitment around 10% of the production team on our Paralympics recovery being, from being disabled, and to meet 14 young people who were the first raft of that programme, who were going into the industry across all broadcasters, and will then go on and have careers successfully, I think that comes from putting it in the very front of your mind. And I genuinely think, uh, I'll speak on behalf of everyone else here as well, I think for the first time ever, it is registered in a meaningful way, and there will be real change. And I'll be very, very surprised if we don't see a palpable difference in a year or so's time. Peter? Um, well, the question was about barriers, and I, I don't think there's, especially, I'd rather not think in terms of barriers. I think we're able to make change here, and we should make change here. I think that uh, a lot has been spoken about this subject in the last couple of years. We've all kind of declared policies and, and, and you know, approaches to it. I see it day to day um, in the relationship we have with the people who make programs with us. Um, uh, we never discuss programs now without discussing uh, diversity during the commissioning process. You then see the effect on screen. Um, nobody's pretending it's perfect. We've got a monitoring coming early next year, I think called Diamond Monitoring, which will hold it up to the light um, in ways that, that might make us think, God, we've got a lot more to do yet. But I think you start seeing it everywhere. I mean, I'll give just one example at ITV. We, we, we've got the Rugby World Cup this, this autumn. We're doing the Wheelchair Rugby World Cup alongside it. I don't think we did that four years ago with the last Rugby World Cup or four years before that and before that and so on. These are real changes that you can see on screen and they're pointing in the right, right direction but when the monitoring comes we'll, we'll probably find we've got a long way to go yet. I think it's, um, <clears throat> I sort of agree with what everyone else has said. I, th I think it's like the big things. So Sky, we've got our targets um, that we're going to hit by the end of 2015. I think it's also the small things, the everyday things. So, um, again, I think I've chatted with all the panel privately about, you know, it's making sure there's uh, diverse casting. I think, actually, I think the, the Jeremy Clarkson thing was a, a big moment. I think everyone thinking we're not going to think it's funny or something to giggle at that someone's used the N-word or the word slope. I think hats off to Danny. I phoned Danny to say that. I think, um, so it's in, it's in the everyday soft things, and it's also in the big targets. It definitely feels, as an industry, we're, we're, we're beyond the tipping point now, I think, in this area. I think the next thing for us as an industry is probably disability. I think Channel 4 taking the lead on that, and that's great. But uh, I think our representation of disabled people on screen, behind the scenes, is pretty woeful, actually. Okay, we've got about two minutes left, but this being an election year, we thought we would end on our leaders' debate by asking each of you, which politician you most identify with? <laughs> Blimey. Blimey. I just, I'm really not a political person. A litter annoys me a lot. A no litter. cheating at the back. No cheating no, at the back. I can't hear the question. question. I'm sorry. I'm asking which leader you most identify with, oh, okay. this being an election year. I don't know. Andy Burnham, because he's a bit, bit daft. I don't know. Um, <laughs> and you've got the eyelashes. Yeah, a litter annoys me. If there's a politician that could sort out litter, I'd vote for them. Um, Lloyd George. Oh, God. <laughs> what, and I didn't say a living one. And you I think Andy Burnham. Politician. Can I he go again? No, present politician. <laughs> he was good. Present politician. Uh, by the way, while we're talking no, about no, this, no, no, this no, idea no, of a no, leader's no, no, debate, no. we're not running for office. Okay, which leader? <laughs> we're, not, we're not trying to get which votes leader, from each other. Which leader, which popular that, leader, um, leader that obviously you're in office, given the job you do. Current politician? Yeah. Uh, oh, God, can you come back to me? Can you no. go to Jay first? Um, uh, Cameron. Oh, God, you're I really just don't know. To, he's really similar to Cameron. Like Cameron. <laughs> <laughs> Fina financially, gonna, anyway. Are, are you going to let that? I haven't got an answer. You're as rich as David Cameron, are you? Sorry? As rich as David Cameron. I'm not. It's harsh. <laughs> Jay. Well, it's a bit sad there are so few female role models, actually, isn't it, when you think about that? I'm, I might have to be, yeah, thanks, Stuart. So <laughs> obvious. Um, uh, <laughs> I don't know. I'm afraid I'm with Peter. I think it's a bit ropey old question. I mean, who do I like? I, I, Nick Clegg is a challenger, but it didn't end well for him, so he's probably a really bad example. I don't know. 
Uh, John Wissingdale. <laughs> I didn't see on that note. Yeah, yeah, I'm not going to top that one. Try. Well, if Jay's not going to have Mrs. Thatcher, I'll have Mrs. Thatcher. <laughs> a lot of my team would say I'm not unlike Mrs. Thatcher. Just um, leaves Nick Clegg's the best looking, though. Yeah. So. yeah. I'm going to come back to you, Peter. Do you want... Now you've heard the clever ones, do you want to have another go? Oh, well... Uh, um, no. <laughs> no, because I don't want to align myself with any party, either. So, so if I say I admire, you know, whoever... I'm sorry, I'm just, I'm I just... Can I think for a bit? No, because we've run out of time, but I came back to you because I wanted to thank ITV as our sponsors oh, yes, for let's. today's uh, debate. Thank you very much indeed, and thanks to all our audience uh, and indeed our panellists as well. I want to just leave you with this, these words from Ofcom. Predicting the speed of change in broadcasting is impossible. Being prepared is essential. Thanks for coming.